From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Adventures of Amy, starring Gene Cagney. To introduce the drama, here is your host, Jack Haley. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our drama, The Adventures of Amy, starring Gene Cagney. <laughs> It was 6.35 Central Standard Time as we dropped through the overcast and leveled off on our approach to runway number three at the Chicago Midway Airport. Looking down through the early evening darkness, I could see the crisscrossing pattern of runways come nearer and nearer. And then we were on the ground, and I felt happy. <laughs> and a little sad. I had reached a sort of milestone. As air stewardess Amy Wilson, I had just completed my 200th commercial flight. I hope you enjoyed your trip, Mr. Eden. Sure did, young lady. Always enjoy a North American flight, and especially when you're in charge. Uh -huh. You wouldn't be taking a flight back to New York Sunday, would you? Afraid not. I'm here until Tuesday, and then we go down to Kansas City. Well, give my best to that bald-headed skipper of yours. Maybe <laughs> I'll catch you next month. All right. Bye, Miss Deaton. Good luck on that contract. Thanks. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, when you do get back to New York, I wonder if you'd return this book to the library at the terminal. I'd appreciate it. Of course, Mr. Eden. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, see you, Amy. Bye. Excuse me, stewardess. Oh. Uh, I, I <laughs> hope I didn't frighten you. Uh, no, I, I just thought everyone had left the ship. Well, I waited. I... Uh... I wanted to ask a favor. Why, certainly, Mr. Uh, Carson. Uh, that's mm -hmm. right. I, I imagine this is a little irregular, but I I wonder if you, or maybe one of the pilots or pursers, would uh, would run a little errand for me. Well, I... You see, I promised to deliver this briefcase to a man at the Sherman Hotel. I, I said I'd get it to him by 8 o'clock tonight. It's rather important, and I'm going to be jammed up on time. I've got a business appointment out south. Oh, I'd be glad to do it. Oh, that's wonderful. I sure appreciate this. I'm staying in the loop anyway. Now, I want you to take this $10 bill for cab fare, and uh, uh, here, I'll, I'll write down the man's name. It's Jason. Hugh Jason. There, at the Sherman. And just leave it at the desk. Oh, really, Mr. Carson, I can't take this Sure money. you can. It's for the cab fare. That's only right. Now, here's the briefcase. And, and thanks again. Oh, but listen... I'm late now. Just see that he gets it by 8 o'clock. Goodbye. Before I could say another word, he turned, hurried down the steps, and disappeared in the rain. I looked at the briefcase he'd handed me. It was a new one with a zipper top. Rather heavy for its size. And over the clasp, holding it shut, was a small brass padlock. What do you got there, daughter? Something for the lost and found? Oh, Cleet, I was just coming forward to show this, this thing to you. One of the passengers gave it to me. That's the difference between a stewardess and a chief pilot. We get all the gripes and you get the gratuities. It's not a gratuity, thank you. I'm running an errand for someone. You know, you're going to get in trouble someday doing favors for everybody. Oh. Uh, who gave you the $10 bill? It's a short story, but I'll stretch it out. <laughs> Come on, let's catch that cab. So what do you make of my Mr. Carson, Clay? Oh, not a thing. He asked you to run an errand. You're running an errand. Mm, but there was something... I don't know. Something funny about it, though. The way he waited in the plane until all the others were gone. Oh, and... you're just imagining things. Clayton Plummer, I take your advice on a lot of things, mainly because I respect your judgment. Also because I'm old enough to be your father. But even by you, I won't be told I'm having hallucinations. Very well, Miss Amy. Uh, this guy, Carson, is an escaped Transylvanian, and the briefcase contains the crown jewels... Oh, and... go climb a tree. <laughs> here we are, folks. Okay, what's the freight, Captain? 385. Mm -hmm. Oh, here, Clayton, I'll get it. No, no, that's all right. I'll get it. That's what he gave me the money for. Driver, take it out of this tin. Okay, lady. Look, uh, uh, since I can't buy you a ride, how about coming up to my sister's for dinner? Uh, lots of young, handsome pilots drop around and... And uh... talk shop all night. No, thanks. Hey, lady, excuse me, but you know where you got this bill? Why? Is there something wrong with it? It's hot. Hot? Yeah, stolen. Yeah, look. 
See the list of serious numbers on this card? Are you kidding? No, the Treasury Department puts it out. Hackies are getting bad money pushed at them all the time. That's why I keep this card. You mean counterfeit money? Counterfeit hot, both kinds. Hmm. Now, you see the serious numbers on this tin you gave me? Here, uh, hold it down by the meter. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, now, now look at that number on the card, second from the bottom. Well, I'll be. I told you there was something funny about Carson. Well, that's what you did, daughter. You know the guy who passed you this? We just brought him in on a flight from New York. Well, you better report him to the police. That dough's been stolen probably from a bank. Well, does it oh. say that in your card? No, but they don't fool around with nickels. When they give a series of numbers like this to watch for, it means there's been a whole block of dough lifted up in the thousands. <laughs> Clayton took the $10 bill back from the cab driver and paid him off in singles. And then we entered the lobby of the hotel. All the public phones were in use, so we had to wait in line. Oh, great. Great. What's the matter? Look, the dame in that phone booth's getting ready to drop another dime. There it goes. Give the lady a big fat cigar. Clay, I just thought of something. Huh. What about this briefcase? Hey, maybe we ought to turn that over to the police, too, huh? But, well, if, if there's really nothing wrong with Carson... I mean, suppose he took the bill innocently from someone else. Well, then he hasn't got anything to worry about. Yes, but I promised I'd deliver this to his friend here by 8 o'clock. He said it was important, and it's almost 8 now. Oh, Amy, what's the name of the fellow you're supposed to give it to? Oh, I, I got it written down here. Jason. Hugh Jason. Hmm, Carson to Jason. Sounds like two-thirds of a double play. Well, ha, ha. That's his name. Or better yet, an advertising agency. Let's see. I can't thank you enough for all this help you're giving me. All right. Now, look, here's what you do. While I'm calling the police, you get on the house phone, tell this guy, Jason, who you are, that you've been delayed at the airport. Mm -hmm. Say you'll arrive here at the hotel in about 20 minutes, and you'll give him the briefcase then. During which time, the police will get here, and we'll wash our hands of everything. That's it. So, uh uh-oh. Looks like our pal isn't going to spend the night in that phone booth after all. Now, look, honey, you get a hold of Jason. I'll be through here in a minute. Meet you over by the reservation desk. All right. I was still carrying the briefcase as I started across the crowded lobby toward the row of house phones along the opposite wall. A cluster of five or six men were standing in front of the cigar counter, smoking and looking at magazines. I didn't know there was anyone following me until I felt the pressure on my arm. What are you... Keep walking, miss. Don't make a move. Just keep walking. Mr. Carson, what's... We're going upstairs in that elevator. If you start a fuss, you'll be sorry. Oh, but you... I promise you, miss, you'll be sorry. Now let's go. There were only three other people in the elevator, counting the man who ran it. The two passengers get off at the fourth floor. We get off at the eighth. Do you mind telling me what this is all about? I'll take that briefcase. (laughs) Of course. Who's that pilot you're with calling on the phone downstairs? Just a friend. Why didn't you leave the briefcase at the desk as soon as you came in? We had to telephone. Now listen. Tell me the truth. Is that pilot calling the police? Why? No, why would he do that? It's important that I know. Miss, do you know what's in this briefcase? No. Almost $60,000. I stole it. I work in a bank, and I stole it. I'm telling you this because I want to give it back. I want to turn myself over to the police, but I want to do it my way. Well, if you want to give yourself up, I don't see what difference it It makes. It makes a lot of difference to me. I'm not in this all by myself, and I'm not going to take all the blame for it. So either we handle things my way or not at all. Now, which is it? didn't have any choice. Mr. Carson, the man who had given me the $10 bill and the briefcase, was desperate. He'd disgraced himself, and he'd ruined his career, and now he was sorry. Sorry and frightened. I'll admit it. I'm afraid of you, Jason. He bust the whole operation, and if he isn't caught, my life won't be worth a plugged nickel. And he, he's in this hotel right now? Yes, that's why I wanted you to deliver the money to him. I was going to call the police, and they'd catch Jason red-handed with the stuff. Well, isn't there any other way you could have implicated him? No. He fences the money. What? He sells it. He's pretty clever. All right. All right, I'll help you. What do you want me to do? Ten minutes later, I stepped out of an elevator into the lobby again. I barely had time to look around before Clayt and a tall, lanky man in a brown suit rushed up to me. Honey, where have you been? What? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Young lady, my name is Robinson. This is Lieutenant Robinson, Amy, police department. Oh. Oh, how do you do? Pretty good, Miss Wilson. Where's the briefcase Carson gave you? I gave it back to him. He 
He, he's upstairs. We know he's upstairs. He, he just put a call through to the lobby. You should have hung on to that briefcase. Well, after all, it was his briefcase. Oh, you folks ought to stick to flying airplanes. Hey, I'll sign that statement. Who was Carson calling? The police. Didn't know we were already here. Oh. Oh, I... I guess you know as much about this as... as I do, then. We know he robbed his own bank in New Jersey and says he wants to give himself up. Did he say anything about a man named Jason? Yep. And he wants 15 minutes before we close in on Bootha. Well, all the hotel entrances are blocked. I guess we might as well give it to him. So Mr. Carson got his 15 minutes. We stood there in the lobby, at the wall clock over the reservation desk, watching Mr. Carson's time go by, and listening to Lieutenant Robinson. I talked to the president of the bank this evening about him on the phone, about Carson. Says he's really brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, phenomenal. Add a column of five figures, that kind of thing. Never mm -hmm. make a mistake. Oh. And like during the war, they had him in Washington. The these codes and ciphers, you know. Yeah. Enemy codes. He had an eye for it, a mind for it. Could cut right through the gibberish and, and figure things out. Smart fellow. Oh, my. Ah, makes you kind of wonder, doesn't it? Man with that kind of a brain. And he winds up in a mess like this. <laughs> At 9.05, Lieutenant Robinson and his men started upstairs to room 612, the room that Mr. Carson had told them Jason was occupying. Ten minutes crept by, then 20. What are you so fidgety about? Well, they should have come down by now. I'll bet something's gone wrong. Oh, you worry too much. Look, the place is crawling with cops. If there's any trouble, they can handle it. Maybe Jason gave him the slip. Now, how could he? All Carson has to do is point him out and the party's over. Oh, what do you say we go into the coffee shop and get a sandwich? I'm starving. But supposing Carson hasn't pointed him out, who else would know him on sight? Oh, Lieutenant Robinson hasn't ever seen him. Amy, everywhere in the world you do this. Cairo, London, Wichita. You've got to stick your nose into but something that... But what if something has gone wrong? Like what? Like... Clade. Let's go upstairs and see. There's nothing to see upstairs but a lot of cops. But I've got an idea. No, i got a better one. Let's have a sandwich. I'm going upstairs. Are you coming with me or not? Daughter, will you just once quit trying to save the world? Very well. I'll go by myself. Riding up in the elevator, an idea struck me. If the police hadn't closed in on Jason yet, that might mean it was because he wasn't in his room. And they were still waiting for him to arrive there. And if that was so... I could only think of one other place in the hotel where he might be. I got off at the eighth floor and walked down the empty hallway to the room I'd seen Mr. Carson enter almost an hour ago. I tried the door. It was locked. I was just about to turn and leave when I heard a key in the latch and the door swung open. Yes, sir? Well, I was looking for, for Mr. Carson. So was I, ma'am. I guess we're both too late. Looks like he skipped out. Oh? Don't take my word for it. Step in. See for yourself. I walked into the room, and the pleasant-looking little man with the white hair closed the door after me. He told the truth. There was no sign of Carson. Although, the briefcase I'd given back to him was lying at the foot of his bed. You were a friend of Mr. Carson's, ma'am? Well, in a way. Are you? He wouldn't think so. I'm an investigator for that bank you robbed. I, um, uh, I see you recovered the money. Oh, oh, you mean briefcase, yeah. Got that back anyhow. Just a shame I couldn't have nabbed Carson in the bargain. All of a sudden, I realized there was something wrong. He hadn't seemed surprised at all that I knew Carson kept the money in that briefcase. And he made no effort to explain why it should have been left behind. There was only one conclusion. This small, soft-spoken gentleman with the twinkly eyes was Jason. Maybe I'm just old-fashioned, miss. But how is it a nice girl like you knows a man like Carson? You meet him on one of your airplanes? Why, well, yes. He was a passenger on the flight in from New York this evening. Uh, did you know him very well, Mr... Uh... Uh, Williams, uh, Clarence Williams. No, not too well, miss, just uh, professionally. Oh, I see. Well, I guess I'd better be getting this money down into the hotel vault. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, did you round up the other man who was in on the robbery? Other man? Who's that? Oh, I thought you knew. Mr. Carson told me all about him. His name is... 
Jason. He couldn't help it. Just for a second, his face froze. In another moment, it was warm and friendly again, but I had learned what he didn't want me to know. Just, uh, what is it he told you about this Jason fellow, miss? Well, that he'd helped to organize the robbery, and he was just as guilty as Mr. Carson himself. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Anything else? Did he describe Jason? No, but, well, now let's see. I started talking about anything, everything that, that Carson had told me. I was stalling for time, and I, I was scared. The friendly blue eyes began to harden. And then suddenly, for no reason that I can explain, I, I noticed the calendar. What are you looking at? That, on the floor. It looks like a piece of cardboard sticking out from under the door of that closet. From where? From here, under the door of this closet. Yeah, let me see that. It's just a calendar, or, or part of Give one. Give it to me. He snatched the torn piece of cardboard out of my hand and stared at it. Then he flipped it over on the other side, and I saw what it was. The lower half of one of those calendars you find, tacked up in every hotel closet in the country. Amy? Amy, you in there? Uh, Who's that? A friend of mine. You better let him in. Hey, you all right? When I told Lieutenant Robinson you were upstairs, we started looking oh, for you. Oh, I'm glad you did. Who's this man, Miss Wilson? Uh, my, my name is Williams. I'm a bank investigator. He is not. He's the man you're looking for. He's Jason. My sure? dear young lady. Well, let's see your credentials, Williams. Why, certainly. Uh, here you are, Lieutenant. Hmm. Hey, you look all right. I've been chasing Carson ever since he left New Jersey. Don't you believe him, Lieutenant. That briefcase he's got is the one that Carson gave me. It's full of money. Well, of course it is. And you're trying to get out of here with it. I intend to turn it over to the manager of this hotel for safekeeping. Well, Lieutenant, believe me, he's Hugh Jason. Miss Wilson, this man's credentials are in order. Well, have you found Jason yet? He didn't show up. What about Mr. Carson? We haven't found him either. I think he skipped out, Lieutenant. As I was telling this young lady Lieutenant, here you've that... got to believe me. This man is Jason. Everything he's done has been suspicious. Why, why even this calendar... I looked down at the torn piece of cardboard. For the first time, I, I noticed something significant about it. It had been ripped exactly in half. And then I saw what it meant. Perhaps it was because of what Lieutenant Robinson had told us about Carson down in the lobby, about his mind and how quickly it worked and, and how good he'd been at breaking codes and ciphers during the war. Anyway, I saw it. Clayton, huh? the closet, look in the closet. Now, what's the closet got to do with it? Lieutenant Robinson, please look in the closet. She's out of her head. It's locked. Say what goes on here. Oh, break it open, please. This is ridiculous. Break it open. Mr. Carson's in there. I know he is. Carson? That's the silliest thing I ever heard of. You stick right here, Williams. We'll see how silly it is. Hey, oh. Carson. Oh. He's out cold. Looks like he's been drugged. Yeah, he's alive all right, though. Oh. Yeah, let's get him on the bed here. Yeah, let me give you a hand. That's it. Uh, uh. Phone down for a doctor. And Jason... You stay right where you are. I want to see my lawyer. I got a hunch you'll be seeing plenty of him from now on. Wilkins, take this guy down and book him. Oh. Oh, uh, oh me. You want to sit down, daughter? Oh, I'm going to have to, Clay. I'm just going to have to. Uh, listen, young lady, I, I'm very grateful for this, but what happened? How did you know for sure that Carson was in the closet and this guy was Jason? Yeah, explain it to me. It was... It was the calendar. Calendar? The message in the calendar. He was trying to name the person who drugged him. There's no message on this. Not a thing written on either side of it. As far as I can see, all he did was tear it in half. That's right, but it was the lower half. Those last six months, he pushed out from under the door before he became unconscious. <laughs> okay, Miss Wilson. So, so this is the last six months. Well, what does that give you? Jason. Daughter... I think the strain of all this been just a little too much for you. It has not. Lieutenant Robinson said Mr. Carson was good at codes and ciphers during the war, didn't he? Well, what of it? Lieutenant, did Carson have anything in there he could have written with? A pen or a pencil? I doubt it. He's in his shirt sleeves. Well, that proves it. He couldn't write down Jason's name, so he did the next best thing when he found this calendar. Hmm? Now, look. Look at the lower half. Yeah. The last six months, with December torn off. 
July, J. August, A. September, mm -hmm. S. October, O. November, N. J, A, S, O, N. Jason. Well, I'll be grounded. Oh, I don't know what the commission's going to say about this. Well, you ask Mr. Carson when he comes to if that isn't what he meant. July, August, September. Oh, brother. Do you like it, Mr. Plummer? Not just yet, daughter. Well, I advise you to start liking it right away, because from now on... Oh, don't say it. Every time you tell me to stop trying to help now, people... Now, Amy... Whether we're in Rome or London or Sioux Falls... Well? Well, I just won't pay any attention. <laughs> This is Jack Haley again. You know, we at Family Theater wish to express again our gratitude for your letters of appreciation and criticism of our Family Theater productions. It is, we know, not always convenient for you to write us, but we ask that you be conscious of the fact that the satisfaction we feel in receiving your letters is not only reflected in the production of stories that you want to hear, but is soul satisfying in that it proves to us that the purpose of this program is being met a purpose which has but one goal, family prayer. If this goal can be brought about by good entertainment, stories that you want to hear, then we are encouraged in our purpose. Family prayer is not solely the province of adults, but it serves as the best example we can provide our children. For children should be taught to pray, and they learn best by seeing and doing. That is why week after week we ask you to pray. Pray together as a family. That is why week after week we sum up our purpose with the statement that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you The Adventures of Amy, starring Gene Cagney. Jack Haley was your host. Others in our cast were Howard Culver, Leo Cleary, Billy Bauckham, Jack Crucian, and Francis Urey. The script was written by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home, and inviting you to be with us next week when Family Theater will present A Kind of Treasure, starring Walter Brennan and Natalie Wood. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm -hmm.